Uh, this is visualizing TLS encryption. Uh, one of the reasons that I did this uh, session uh, is because um, when uh, when uh, uh, I started off, I actually have a structural engineering degree. So I went to school to learn how to keep buildings standing up. And uh, But that was at a time in the mid-90s when I graduated, when computers were making their way into business. Uh, I was always a techie from the time I was a little kid and uh, always just playing around with the computers. In fact, uh, even in uh, college, we didn't really have computer labs for the structural engineers that was really designated for only uh, computer engineering, electrical engineering students. Um, but I still was on their VAX playing around on the internet or what the internet was at the time. And um, so it was always fascinating to me. And uh, as I moved into IT, what I realized was, was most of the documentation that was out there for learning about protocols and how this stuff worked was really designed for and written by um, engineers who had advanced degrees. So oftentimes when you read documentation from somebody written, somebody that writes with a master's degree, they're using a language that is oftentimes beyond what uh, a non or a slightly less non-technical person can handle. So um, uh, as I moved through my career, I struggled with all the documentation and just had to hack away at IT stuff until I learned it. Uh, in the last couple of years, I really wanted to learn more about TLS and how encryption works. And if you go online and you try to learn about it uh, just by using Google searches, what you'll find typically is one of two possibilities. You're either going to get the master's degree thesis of how it works with all the challenging language, or you're going to get somebody who doesn't know anything about encryption who's going to tell you that the, uh, the private key encrypts the data and the public key decrypts it or vice versa, which isn't entirely untrue, but it's not how TLS and, and website encryption work. So my goal was to make this more accessible and so that everybody can walk away from this with some idea of how the encryption is working so that we understand uh, what exactly uh, uh, is happening with TLS. We can learn how to decrypt it understand the handshake and, and whatnot, and have a much, much better opportunity of really knowing what's happening here without having to understand uh, enormous words or challenging math. So visualizing TLS encryption here. Um, before we get into the session topics, a little bit more about me. Right now, I've um, in, in the past 20 years, I've worked as both an IT engineer, a network engineer, and also a technical trainer. So I've worked um, at uh, a few two-year colleges, teaching students how uh, networking works, getting them jobs, uh, literally pulling them out of the gutter sometimes and, and getting them some really great jobs. It's been a really rewarding experience. The last five years of my life, I've spent creating videos, training videos for CCNA, NetPlus, and Wireshark, uh, and some other stuff uh, for Pluralsight. Um, and Pluralsight, if you don't know, they are an IT training company, mainly for developers, but we have a massive IT operations library as well. Uh, if anybody's interested in checking it out, uh, I have, I can offer you a 30 day trial uh, of that uh, service. Uh, there's no, no need to put any credit cards in or anything like that. No obligations. If you're not interested, no big deal. Uh, just uh, shoot me an email or, or talk to me after the session. So the topics for this session, then we're going to look at uh, SSL versus TLS. Uh, if you look online too, there's all kinds of crazy stories about the differences between these two. Uh, so we'll talk about the history of TLS and SSL. Uh, we'll look at uh, what encrypting data is like. I think generally most of us have a understanding of this. Where we're going to look at encrypting data and what's needed for this to happen. We'll look at a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, and we'll see how that is actually a super accessible um, way to understand the key exchange process. We'll look at some data encryption protocols that we use, and then we will do some decrypting of TLS right in Wireshark. I posted this link in the chat 
for the in the Discord chat for this room. Uh, this has all of the this has all the info we you would need for this. Uh, it has the the link there, of course. Uh, my Twitter and email address. Uh, my work at Plural site here. Uh, I have a couple links that um, uh, that uh, are extremely useful in understanding TLS. Um, Michael Driscoll made these these uh, links, and it's an illustrated TLS uh, 1.2 and 1.3, and he goes through the entire uh, process of how the um, this works, goes down right down to the to the bits, and tells you every little detail about it. So you can really drill down in this and and spend a lot of time on on this. I think I've spent quite a few hours working through this um, over the years. Uh, and then uh, the captures for the presentation are also in that one note. Uh, I'll try to get the slides up there. I'm not sure that I have permission to post the slides yet or not. I have to ask Pluralsight because it uses a lot of their assets. All right, so web browser encryption. Uh, what's going on here? So when we talk about web browser encryption and we want to encrypt uh, the data that we're sending back and forth between the client and the server, we really have two components to this. One component is that we need to negotiate the encrypted session, right? So we need some protocol to negotiate between the client and the server to figure out what protocols we're going to use and um, how we're going to set up that encryption. The second component is, is the encryption protocols themselves, right? So to negotiate the encrypted session, we can use SSL or TLS. To encrypt our data, we need uh, two of these six protocols. So we can use RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, triple DES, AES, and ChaCha20. We're going to talk about all of this as we move through the presentation. So history here, history lesson. So 1994, Netscape Navigator came out. This is a this is part of a, uh, this is the commercial end of a project that came out of U University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana uh, in 94, right when HTTP came out. And uh, this was the first web browser available commercially. Uh, it cost money to buy it. So you had to pay Netscape money to, to download this. Maybe not as an end user, but definitely as a business user, you had to pay money for this application, just like you would any other application at the time, whether it be WordPerfect or Quattro Pro, uh, I think Word and Excel were around then, just not as popular. So uh, you had to pay for this and get a license to use it. Uh, and uh, as Netscape quickly found out, businesses really wanted to take advantage of this technology. And But in order to do that, they needed some type of encryption. So Netscape engineers came up with SSL version 2 which was very, very quickly determined to be um, uh, easily crackable. So you could, you could uh, go get, get through the protocol and decrypt the data. So just a year later, they came out with SSL version three. And it wasn't that long ago that probably a matter of three, four years ago where companies were actually still using SSL version three, which is a bad idea, but uh, it's been around for a long time. <clears throat> All right, so uh, with, with Netscape Navigator coming out, what also came out in 1995 that was significant in the world of IT? Well, well, well what operating system in 1994 would you install Netscape Navigator on? In 94, though, Windows 3.1. Anybody use Windows 3.1? <laughs> right. So Windows 3.1, thank you. Um, you'd install this on Windows 3.1. Well, 95, Windows 95 came out, of course, in 1995. And uh, what came bundled with Windows 95? Internet Explorer. And you didn't have to pay for Internet Explorer. It came right along with the operating system. So uh, it, it was Microsoft's goal to get rid of Netscape Navigator by uh, giving away Internet Explorer for free. Uh, and this was the start of the browser wars, of course. And does anybody know this, this movie? <laughs> yeah, war, uh, yeah, war games, yes. Uh, shall we play a game? 
Uh, and uh, uh, so 95 started the browser wars. Microsoft really wanted to put Netscape out of business and they pretty much succeeded, uh, which brings us to the name. So Microsoft Internet Explorer came with encryption in SSL version three. Uh, but by 1999, the, the browser wars were, were pretty much over by then. Microsoft had most of the share of the market and uh, they wanted to make an RFC specifically for web encryption. Microsoft did not want SSL as the name because that was Netscape's name for it. So Microsoft uh, pushed and with the RFC, they changed the name to TLS. So TLS 1.0 and SSL version 3.0 are about the same protocol. There's very slight differences between the two. So what's the difference between SSL and TLS? Literally nothing. It's the same protocol with a new name. Um, as time has passed now, we are up to versions TLS 1.2 and 1.3. Most of the transactions you see on the internet today are gonna be TLS 1.3. We should hope that they're 1.3. It's a super efficient version of the encryption compared to 1.2. And we're gonna see that later on when I go through the packet capture, we'll see the the difference in how much more efficient TLS 1.3 is during the handshake process than 1.2. Plus we can encrypt the data lots faster with TLS 1.3. So let's talk about data encryption basics here. So we wanna send a message from the client, from an HTTPS client to an HTTPS server. So what we need to do is we need to take that message. We're gonna run it through some encryption algorithm, typically a symmetric key algorithm where both the client and the server are gonna use the same key and the same algorithm to encrypt it. So we run it through an algorithm along with a secret key that we create or that is created. It encrypts the message. We can then send that message across the wire, across the public internet to our server. The server can then reverse the process by taking the same algorithm, same key and decrypting the message. And now we're left with the original message on the server that the client sent before it was decrypted. The challenge here is that we need a key that's exactly the same on both sides. So the client and the server need the identical key to do this, but we cannot send that key across the public internet or users on the internet will be able to grab the key and decrypt the traffic, making our encryption useless. So we need some kind of protocol then to exchange the key. We just can't send the key across the wire. And that's where a key exchange protocol comes in. So before we can do data encryption, we have to negotiate a key between the client and the server. So one of the ways we can do that is with a protocol called Diffie-Hellman. So Diffie-Hellman, uh, and there's one other gentleman that I don't remember his name. Uh, Diffie-Hellman actually came up with the same idea that somebody else had come up with several years earlier. Uh, Diffie-Hellman, uh, got credit for it, even though uh, somebody else actually had, uh, had developed most of this technology. But this is pretty cool mathematics. This isn't an IT thing. This is just mathematics and cryptography. So here's how it works. When we're doing uh, TLS encryption, uh, one of the parts of the process is that we send a certificate from the server to the client. The certificate serves multiple purposes. And in the case of a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, there are two prime numbers inside of the certificate that are useful, that become our public key, and that's the value P and G. So here I've just chosen two small values for P and G, 149 and 17, uh, just to make this process easy and accessible. Uh, in reality, these prime numbers are much, much larger. So we send the certificate across to the client, uh, the client will look at the certificate, pull out the P and G value. That is the public key. Everybody can know about those values. Client is then going to choose a private key. I picked eight. Client key, the client private key is going to be much, much larger than this. But again, we're keeping the math simple. Uh, and then what we do is we do some mathematics, right? So we take our G value. We raise it to the power of our private key and then mod P. Yesterday, uh, Gerald talked about the modulo. 
mod here is modulus modulo it's it's just calculating the remainder so if you don't remember this from uh grade school well i'll remind you here so we have 95 divided by eight right so we we do the math here eight goes into nine one time that leaves a remainder of 15 eight goes into 15 one time again and we can keep doing this calculation to calculate our decimal points here but really we're not after that what we're after is the remainder and uh that's seven so our modulus is seven so in in this modulus math all we're doing is just calculating the remainder of some um of this this uh, formula here so g to the uh, g to the power of a that's 17 to the power of 8 mod 149 equals 5 and i'm calling this our encrypted key this is a, a key information that we share publicly then with the server so we do that calculation and then we send that information to the server server does the same thing server picks its own private key i pick six here it's going to run the same formula g to the power of the private key mod p in this case we get 16. so the server then sends 16 back to the client so now what we do is we run the same formula again this time though we take our encrypted key that we've exchanged with each other we raise it to the power of our private key mod p and on the client side we get 129 on the server side we get 129 so our key becomes 129. 129 was never shared between the client and the server. The only way to get 129 is to have a private key of eight on the client side and a private key of six on the server side. So if you can guess those numbers out on the public internet, you can figure out the key. But in theory, these private keys, <clears throat> in theory, these private keys should be large enough in order that you can't guess it. However, there are issues with uh, the way Diffie-Hellman is implemented that make it somewhat, I don't wanna say somewhat easy, but it make it possible to actually figure out the key uh, without knowing the private keys. So with that, uh, we don't actually use Diffie-Hellman anymore, not this version of it, but this version of it, in my opinion, is a really great way to understand actually how kind of elegantly simple this process is to exchange a key between two parties without having anybody else be able to figure out what it is. So for our key exchange then, we have different options. Remember in the beginning, I said we have these six protocols and we have to use two of them to make it work. Well, for the key exchange portion of this in TLS 1.2, we have three different options we can choose from for our key exchange. RSA is one of them. Uh, RSA, Rivish, Shamir, Edelman, they came up with a similar process for D that Diffie Hellman did back in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, the, the process allows for the same key exchange process. We don't use it anymore. And we don't use it not because the protocol itself is bad, but the way it's implemented makes it potent has makes it have a potential to be uh, compromised so we don't use rsa to do our key exchange anymore uh, i've already said we don't use diffie hellman for the same reason the way that it's implemented in computers makes it somewhat vulnerable to compromise so we don't use diffie hellman anymore either diffie hellman in and of itself is completely fine it's just the way that it's implemented which leaves us with this new one elliptical curve diffie hellman I'll give you a rundown of how that works shortly. In TLS 1.3, we don't get to pick. You get to use elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman. That's it. And this will make sense in a little bit. So let's talk about elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman. So one of the values that we needed in the key exchange process with straight up Diffie-Hellman or RSA is we needed the certificate. So we needed that certificate that had our public key in it that we could send from the server to the client. And we could not calculate any keys until we got that certificate. With elliptical curve, we don't need the keys in the certificate at all. We can just start the process. As a matter of fact, the client can start this process. So here's how this works. The, the elliptical curve, um, I drew, uh, 
<laughs> this is my my drawing of elliptical curve that we're using here. Uh, theoretically, it should be something similar to the X25519 curve, um, but it, it's likely way off. Uh, anyway, there are different predefined curve types that the client and the server can choose from. Most implementations today on the server side and the client side are going to pick X25519, but there are different curve types here. It's just a different, slightly different formula to calculate this curve on the graph. So when we're doing a TLS 1.3 elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, what's going to happen is the client is going to pick a curve type. So in most cases, like I said, it's going to pick the X25519. The client is also going to choose a private key. It's going to pick a large random number private key. And what will happen is through the private key, we're going to pick a point on the curve. And we're going to do a bunch of iterative math to pick several points on this curve and use those points to come up with a public key. So really, we're using the curve and some math to calculate a public key. One of the links that I have on the, uh, on the OneNote page is actually for Michael Driscoll's animated version of how this happens. So if you want to really dive deeper into the math of what's happening with this curve, he does a really great job of showing several animations and walks you through all the calculations of this. Uh, I'm, I'm just keeping it very simple here. So, <clears throat> and, and I literally made these numbers up. These aren't, this is, this is not a real calculation here. These are truly made up numbers. So what happens then is the client in its very first message to the server is going to say, here's my public key. And this is the curve type I picked. If you can use that, great. If you can't use it, the server will reply back with the curve type it can use with a public key. But if the server can use the 25519 curve, what it'll do is it's going to do the same exact calculation, right? So it's going to take the curve type plus its private key. It's going to come up with its own public key and send that over to the client. And now this information looks real similar to what we saw with the straight up Diffie Hellman, right? We have a private key and some pu public key exchange. Now we can run the calculation in reverse and we can actually come up with the identical key on both sides. So now the client and the server have an identical key that they've calculated on both sides. They use that key to derive some application keys. And these application keys are the same on both the client and the server. And we can actually use those keys to encrypt our data then. So that key exchange process is like the critical component to doing a proper TLS encryption for web browsers. <clears throat> so once we have the key exchanged, now we can use a symmetric key uh, encryption protocol. So here we have uh, three different ciphers we can use. We can use triple DES, we can use AES, or we can use ChaCha20. Well, triple DES is the oldest one that came out of the 70s or 80s. Uh, it used to just be DES encryption, and uh, DES encryption was somewhat weak. I think it had 56 bits in its key. Uh, so we fixed that by just running it through the algorithm three times uh, to create a 168 bit key. And uh, Triple DES actually uh, can be used, but AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, uh, was part of a competition that came to find the next generation protocol for uh, Triple DES. So AES is the one of the preferred encryption protocols we use for this. Uh, another one is ChaCha20, which came out a few years after AES, and both of these are proper secure ways to encrypt data with a key, with a symmetric key. So in TLS, we're gonna use either AES or ChaCha20, most encryption that you see on the internet's using AES. So we have key exchange, we have data encryption. Second to the last component of TLS encryption here is handshake integrity. Uh, why do we need handshake integrity? Anybody have an idea? 
Yeah, man in the middle attack. In case, in case somebody's listening to our TLS conversation, uh, we use handshake integrity protocols to make sure that uh, we have some way of checking to see if somebody tampered with the data while it was not either on the client device or the server device. So uh, what we use for that is we use a hash algorithm, either SHA-256 SHA or SHA-384. And the way that works is we take, a, we take every single, um, we take a piece of every single component in the handshake and we run it through the secure hash algorithm and it comes up with a number. And we put that number in one of our handshake messages. We send that message to the client or to the server and then we can do a reverse calculation and find out if those numbers match, right? So uh, uh, the client has all the pieces of the handshake, the server has all the pieces of the handshake, both the client and the server can run the same exact calculation, compare it to the number that's inside of one of the handshake messages. If the numbers match, great. It appears that no one tampered with the message. If the numbers don't match, it means that either somebody tampered with the message or maybe there's something wrong on the network and bits are getting flipped. But generally speaking, handshake integrity uh, involves just making sure that uh, the, the handshake has not been tampered with. The last piece of this puzzle is server authenticity. Now in TLS 1.3, I said, we don't use the certificate for any encryption. So the certificate is only used for server authenticity, right? So when we talk about certificates, uh, the way certificates work is, uh, this is wildly basic. Uh, we have some type of certificate authority. You can set up your own certificate authority at home on Linux using something like OpenSSH. Um, but a certificate authority is typically uh, an agency on the internet that issues valid certificates to uh, servers so that we can validate that that server is who it says it is. And the way that's done is uh, the root certificate is created at the certificate authority. The certificate authority then will work with operating system vendors uh, and browsers to make sure that, that a copy of that root certificate is installed on every single computer. That way, when uh, that way we can validate the certificate. So certificate authority then will use the root certificate plus a key to generate an intermediate certificate. And then that intermediate certificate will be combined with a key to generate server certificates. So the server certificate is chained to the intermediate certificate, which is chained to the root certificate. The server certificate then gets installed on an HTTPS server. And one of the components of the handshake in TLS is to send the certificate to the client. What will happen then is the client will compare that mathematically with the root certificate that's stored on the root certificate store on the workstation. If there is a mathematic, if the mathematics say, yep, the certificate came from this root certificate, great, the server is who it says it is. If it's not, and there's no match there, you're gonna get a certificate error on your workstation and it's gonna say, hey, are you sure you wanna do this? Certificate errors can happen in many ways. If you build your own uh, web server at home on Linux and you just use a default cert on there, you're definitely going to get definitely going to get a certificate error um, unless you install the root certificate on your client, which uh, which is done often. I don't want to go too deep into this because uh, this could be a whole class in and of itself. So when we talk about certificates, what's in there? Uh, we can use a server certificate to do RSA encryption, but we don't do that anymore. We can use uh, the certificate P and G values to do Diffie-Hellman, but we don't do that anymore either. So what, what's left, we use the certificate for verification information uh, for the certificate chain to make sure our cert is signed and is appropriate. So there we go, TLS encryption, four steps, key exchange, uh, data encryption, handshake integrity, and then server authenticity. So let's go take a look at some captures here. So in order to um, 
understand what's happening with the handshake, we need to be able to decrypt the data in Wireshark. So the, oftentimes the decryption of the data in Wireshark is not so much to get the data out. It's more to understand what's happening and troubleshoot the handshake and other components of, uh, of that uh, uh, conversation. So uh, I'm gonna show you how to get the uh, key the encryption key for these, uh, both in Mac and in Windows. I forgot that my M1 Mac doesn't support <laughs> standard Windows. So I, do, I can show, I don't have Wireshark set up and running correctly on it yet, but I can show you how to, how to export the keys on it. So we'll start with Mac here. And uh, it's actually a pretty simple process. Let's get Wireshark running. And uh, what I do is we go to a command to get our keys. Uh, we need to issue the command export SSL key log, it's too many S's, SSL key log file equals, and then uh, we give it a directory. So I'm going to put it in here. And then a file name, I'm just gonna call this key, key log dot key, bad assignment, there we go. And then we do um, open dash a Firefox. And start a capture now. And uh, let's just go to wireshark.org. Stop the capture. So let's find some TLS messages here. Let's do this. Uh, Follow TCP stream. So here is our TLS 1.3 handshake. Let's see if we can make that a little bigger. Cincinnati act for TCP. And then we have our client hello. And our client hello, if we take a look at what's happening here, uh, we see. Key share. The key share information, it's saying group X25519. And then there's the key that I calculated. So that's the public key that we're sending from the client to the server. So this is not encrypted data yet. This is all um, unencrypted. The server replies back. And it does the same thing. It says, yep, key share X25519. Here's the key that the server sent back to the client. Now, uh, everything after this, is encrypted. So we can't see this information anymore. So this is where we go in and uh, enter in our key that we captured. So what I do is I right click on transport layer security, go to protocol preferences, open TLS preferences, and then down here, it says pre-master secret log file name, just browse to documents, SSL key log, we grab that. And now that same packet that I just had selected here, now it says encrypted and stack extensions certificate. We didn't see that certificate before. So here, this was encrypted. So the certificate and TLS 1.3 is actually encrypted now. So here's the, the exchange of the certificate. Uh, it has, a, a, um, well, at any rate, we have the, the certificate information here. Once this is done, uh, they, the client and the server finish up here with this change cipher spec finished, 
And now everything after that is our data. And you can actually see the website coming through now, HTTP2. Uh, we can't actually decrypt this and, or we can't actually see what's happening here in Wireshark just because uh, HTTP, HTTP2 uses a stream instead of uh, clear text information. But here's the website being transferred then. And with the decryption, we can actually see all this information uh, real time. Does that make sense? Uh, in Windows, to get that key log file, uh, this is Windows 11. And to do this, uh, we go to Control Panel, and then System, and then About. Of course, it's much easier in Windows, right? Advanced System Settings, Environment Variables, and then in environment variables, I realize this is probably tiny for you guys to see in the back, but in environment variables here, we're gonna create a new environment variable under user variables. Uh, the variable name is SSL key log file. I didn't get that. Well, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> SSL key log file. And then we pick a place to put it, browse, uh, browse directory here. We'll just put it on um, uh, documents. And then uh, we'll put it in SSL key log. Uh, what's the question again? Uh, when you open the web browser, so if, so on Mac or Linux, when you issue this command, export SSL keylog file, and then you use the same terminal to open up Firefox, what will happen is Firefox will write the key right to the folder, right to this file. So this, these two steps is what's actually writing the, writing that keylog file to the to that directory that we can use and I, I can actually show that happening in just a second in windows uh key log uh we just specify the file name in the same way we give it a name in in the directory that we choose hit okay and now when we open up a web browser it's going to write to that file as well um if we look here, so key this this is the file that I generated on my Mac. Right now, the file I called was key. I called the file key.log for Windows. So if I open up Firefox, go to Wireshark.org. Uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, well, that looks right. So once I opened up, once I reopened up Wireshark after, or reopened up Firefox after I created the entry, now we have this new file in here called key.log. So in this key.log file, you can see there's a bunch of hex values in there. These are all of our keys for this. Yes. Uh, this is for either, this is for any of anything. SSL version, SSL version three, all the way through TLS 1.3. It'll work the same to prevent this from happening um yeah no it, it uh the the pfs so 
so the, the question was for, for those on Zoom was um, uh, uh, that in TLS 1.3, there's perfect forward secrecy that is done with the elliptical curve protocol, but you can still capture the keys on the local device and use them to decrypt the traffic. Uh, but the difference is, is that in some of the other protocols, um, like Diffie-Hellman and RSA, you can actually predict, um, you can predict, I, I'm, I'm talking a little bit out of, out of my space here, but I believe in RSA, the, you can, when you encrypt the data with a key, you get similar output and, or you get the same output, so you can use that to uh, get around that, and that's where perfect forward secrecy fails. Something special happens in, in elliptical curve to make this, this happen. And like I said, that's a bit beyond my, my scope for this, so. Okay. Yeah, and it's not just a folder, you need to specify a file name. So you need to, you need to specify the folder and you need to give it a file name. I called mine key.log. It doesn't matter what the file name is. It can be at literally anything you want it to be. And yeah, so here on, we'll go back to the Mac just because, uh, yeah. Uh, Chrome and Firefox will work like this. Safari, I don't believe works, and I'm not certain about Edge. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, I think Edge does work. The current versions of Edge do work, and they'll export the key file for you. Um, Safari, I don't believe does. So if I delete this file, And uh, let's, um, how, how long does this go, Janice? 11.30, okay. So I'm going to delete both the key log files here. Uh, let's close Firefox and I'm going to reopen it. You can see that immediately when I launch Firefox, it regenerates that key log file. And it's going to think it's a keynote presentation, of course. But yeah, once once you uh, once you launch Firefox through that window, it's going to immediately generate this. On Windows, it's the same way. If you delete the file and then you reopen Firefox, it'll immediately generate that file again. So, all right, let's take a look at some captures. All right, unless you have other questions. So I have a couple captures in here we can look at. So uh, let's start with, um, let's look at a TLS 1.2 uh, capture first. So here is TLS 1.2. Um, in TLS 1.2, it's, it's a little bit different here. So with TLS 1.2, what we're doing is the, the client hello is going to send 
a message to the server. And in that message, it's gonna tell the server all of the Cypher suites that it supports. And these include, uh, here it says elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman with AES-128 and SHA-256. So those are our three protocols that we're using uh, for uh, negotiating this encryption, right? Our key exchange, our um, symmetric key encryption, and then SHA-256 is for handshake integrity. Uh, and down here, you see we have some with RSA in here. And there's a reason a lot of times we used RSA in this, or we supported RSA here, and that's for troubleshooting. So if you were uh, working as a administrator uh, and you're trying to, to troubleshoot things, you could actually force RSA to be the key exchange, which uses a certificate and you can do some trickery with the certificate to do decryption here. But generally speaking, you'll see that all the other ones are elliptical curve and it's just choosing a different uh, different encryption protocol, AES here, here's ChaCha20, uh, AES256, or a different handshake uh, um, integrity protocol. So the client sends that hello message. It says, hey, I support all these versions. The server comes back and it picks one of them. And it says right here, the Cypher suite that it chose is elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman uh, using RSA here. The RSA, this is for uh, uh, integrity, right? It's just checking the integrity of this. AES-128 GCM is checking integrity of that. And then SHA-256 for handshake integrity. So it's choosing one of the protocols in the client's suite. The server then sends the certificate over to the client. The client then sends its key that it chose through that calculation uh, with the elliptical curve. It sends the key back to the server. The server does the same thing back. And at this point now, now the message is encrypted. We can decrypt this message by putting in our key. Right-click on TLS, uh, Properties, Protocol Preferences, Open TLS Preferences, and then I go grab that key. It's this one, I know that's the... Is that the wrong key? I do. Oh, this is it. There we go. So yeah, now it says, uh, now instead of saying change cipher spec encrypted data, now it says finished. And then our very next message here, get HTTP 1.1. You can see our HTTP data here. This is not using HTTP 2, this is a little bit older. And you can see pluralsite.com in here and you can see other information. And we can actually see some of the website getting downloaded here. Um, through HTTP 1. So that's TLS 1.2. We can see that uh, the handshake goes uh, client hello, server hello, server sends a certificate, client sends a key, server sends the key, and then it's finished. Let's take a look at TLS 1.3 again. Yes. Uh, at the end of a TLS connection, at the end of the TLS connection here, um, we're just sending a message here that just said, uh, I, no, I wasn't planning on covering it, but in TLS 1.2, we're just sending a message that says we're closing and then fin, well, reset in this case, but finac reset, right, all the same. Right. What it's ha what's happening, right? Yep. Yeah. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at what happens in TLS one point three with that too.
I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, and the question was for those on Zoom, uh, is it always the, is the alert message always this uh, uh, close notify message? And uh, yeah, I do not know the answer to that. All right, so here's a uh, TLS one three. Let's put the key in there. Oh, okay, so this is this is a this is actually a good one to take a look at. Where uh, this is my bad certificate. So let's take a look at what's happening on the good side first. Well, first let's do this. So this is me connecting to my home firewall and my home firewall is HTTPS. Um, however, the circuit certificate is unsigned. So when we do this, we get the client hello. Uh, we get the server hello. And the server hello then, uh, should be sending the certificate, but then we get an alert here. It says level fatal description, bad certificate. What's happening on my web browser at this time? You're getting a warning. Yeah, it's saying, hey, this is a bad certificate. You shouldn't be doing this. And then you have to go in and say, yep, uh, this is fine. I'll keep going. And after that, it's gonna start a new TLS session. And here we get our client, hello. Right, the client hello, just like we saw earlier, it's immediately sending. It does, it does show a list of ciphers that we can use here. But do you notice something different about these ciphers, especially the top two here? What protocol is missing in these top two? Top three. Yeah, the ECDH, right? Down here, we have elliptical curve Diffie Hellman. And then on top, these three don't have that included. Well, what, the, what this client is saying, it's saying, well, one, I'm gonna try TLS 1.3 and I'm gonna send you all the information for TLS 1.3. And if for some reason server, you don't support that, I still support TLS 1.2. And I know that because I'm telling you some of the cipher suites I send have elliptical curve in them. So we can actually revert back to TLS 1.2 if needed. but we're also sending our key exchange, right? So right here's our key exchange information coming in the client hello. So the client hello is saying, we're gonna try TLS 1.3, here's the curve I'm using, here is the, uh, the key, let's try it. The server comes back and it says, yeah, I support TLS 1.3, says, um, well, it says TLS 1.2 here, but this is only used because TLS 1.3 is so strange. In order to get these messages through corporate data loss prevention devices, uh, we had to trick those devices into thinking it was TLS 1.2. Uh, do you guys know about data loss prevention devices? It's a way of, uh, it's, a, it's an appliance you install at the edge of your network. And all the devices inside of your network, when they send traffic, that traffic is decrypted at that device. The traffic is inspected against a database of known information that shouldn't be leaked. And uh, it'll flag anybody who's trying to send out information over the public internet that shouldn't be sent out. So it's, it's intended to protect uh, um, intellectual property or medical records or credit card data, all this type of thing. So we're actually decrypting the data as it leaves the network and then re-encrypting it when it goes out to the web just to inspect it in the middle. Uh, and in order to get that device to work, it needs to be tricked into version 1.2, which is why we're, we're doing this. So, but it's actually using TLS 1.3 and we know that it's using TLS 1.3 because the Cypher suite we picked here doesn't have a key exchange protocol listed which means we're using elliptical curve. And then we come back and uh, we, we uh, send our final message from the server to the, from the client to the server saying, yep, we're all good. We've got the uh, uh, certificates, we've got uh, all the encryption set, we're good to go. And then after that, 
we're downloading the website and, and other data. <clears throat> Last one I want to take a look at here is something that Chris is going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, but we're just going to do a little teaser of it. And that's Quick. Have you guys heard of Quick? Q U I C? Quick is uh, Google's new implementation of TCP. So here is uh, me going to YouTube to look at uh, one of uh, Chris's videos. Uh, what's special about this? What, uh, when we use uh, TLS, um, what uh, layer four protocol do we use typically? TCP. Uh, what are we using here? Not TCP, we're using UDP. There's no three-way handshake, right? So quick is supposed to be wildly efficient, right? So UDP has almost no information in it, right? It's, it's just a source and destination port and a couple little options, but then quick is running on top of that. So quick is actually doing all the negotiation for TLS here. Uh, and we can see that better if I decrypt this. Still have to go to TLS. Peter actually just changed this in here not long ago from SSL to TLS. We got updated information. It was a very, very short time ago that this used to all be SSL in here. Yeah, the, all the display, yeah, everything is TLS now, no longer SSL. And uh, did I grab the wrong key? Yes. Although maybe not this moment. <laughs> it says that's the key. For some reason, it's not, uh, it's not letting me do it here. I know here it is. We're we're uh oh is it encrypted inspection? Well, this may be a failed failed piece of this uh reassembled in frame nine. Well, <laughs> I, that's what Quick is basically. It's UDP is the is the protocol used to carry Quick, and then built into Quick, we're using TLS one three. So the idea with Quick is that uh, it's a lot faster to get from. Um, that there's there's two big advantages of it. One is that uh, we're we're go we're ignoring the three way handshake. And we're going right to Quick's handshake, which is much shorter. And in the Quick handshake, we are doing the encryption. We're establishing the encryption right away. And then the second thing Quick is allowing us to do is have is download lots of different streams of traffic all at once. So HTTP two kind of does this over TCP, but Quick is supposed to make it even faster and more efficient. So we're giving up on TCP a little bit, but I think TCP has a long way to go before we we end that one. And uh, I highly recommend talk, going to Chris's presentation tomorrow on Quick. Yeah. That's, I, I believe that's part of Quick. Yeah, I believe HTTP3 is used as, uh, as part of Quick. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go for it. Okay.
got you how do you how okay so so um okay So there's there's a way. Wow. So what for the Zoom for the Zoom followers? What uh, what we're talking about is there's a, uh, a command line interface program. What's it called again? Edicap, and you can actually inject the key into the capture file itself, so you don't have to keep changing it like I've been doing. And then yeah, then you can dump the log file. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. And and yeah, slightly beyond the scope of this uh, for for today, but yes, that's that's outstanding information. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, please fill out the survey. And uh, if you are interested in uh, uh, a trial for Pluralsight, come, uh, come let, me, let me know and I'll help you out. Thanks everybody.